rough the rough month. The rough month. It's been a challenge. Yeah, it's been rigorous. Uh, it's been more than a month. It's been a couple months. We were there was a string of chapters that really runs from 18 through 25, and it's a difficult <laughs> concept. And I'm not going to repeat the whole flow. You could rewatch the classes online if you want to get a review. But what's today about? You know what today's about? Joy. Joy. Thank you. Joy. <laughs> Simcha. Oh, yay. Yeah. Kila, Rina, Ditsa. I'm in for that. So why are we talking about Simcha? Before we start talking about Simcha, Simcha is joy. Not happiness, but joy. What's the difference? B big difference. Happiness happens. It's passive. Joy is something you create. Mm. Happiness means it happens. It's happenstance. If it doesn't, it's a mishap. It's a very uh, victim-type mentality. Joy is a uh, <clears throat> proactive decision. We're going to talk about it. But for context purposes, why are we speaking about joy now? Why is that the subject now? So just a little review of the first 25 chapters of Tanya. A little review. Not intense, just a little review. In chapter one, we spoke about the fact that we have two souls. One just wants self-preservation by any means necessary. And the other is <clears throat> altruistic. That we really learned about in chapter two. The altruistic soul, the selfless soul, the godly soul. And we learned about the fact that they each have their own cognitive and emotional faculties, meaning their perspectives on life and the way they feel about what they believe they've perceived. And that they both express those perceptions and emotions through three behavioral um, modes of expression called thought, speech, and action. And that essentially within each of us there are these two souls vying for who's going to gain self-expression at any given moment. And that's the whole conflict of Tanya. That's basic, basic, basic Tanya. We introduced one method for handling that conflict, managing that conflict. In chapter 12, we said, well, you know what the Benini does, the intermediate guy? He has the inner war of the Russia, but he exhibits behaviors as if he were a tzaddik. <clears throat> His tool, the first tool we learned about, is mayach shalat alalev, impulse control. Your brain controls, controls your heart, so you don't, don't give in to every whim that you have. You just control yourself. Great, beautiful, wonderful tool. Then in chapter Tezayin, Yudzayin, 16 and 17, we learned about a new way of explaining that the brain rules over the heart, which means that if you meditate, use your brain, you'll create emotions in your heart. Brain rules over the heart. Earlier had meant you bypass your emotions and do things that you don't want to do because they're the right thing to do. Then later on, 16 and 17, we learn about using the brain to not bypass your emotions, but to create new emotions, to get yourself congruent, emotionally congruent with the behaviors that you're committed to anyway. That, you following what, these tools? Okay. And then after that, we said, well, what about if the tool for creating emotional congruence is taking too long, which we know that meditation is a lengthy process, a lifelong pursuit and endeavor. Uh, so we said, okay, no problem. We have a short emergency way of doing it, 18 through 25. And I'm not going to review what 18 through 25 was, but the bottom line, the upshot of 18 through 25 was a quick way to get emotionally congruent, to get a, suddenly, a sudden emotional jolt, to have the motivation to do the things that we're supposed to be doing. Okay? So basically, in the first 25 chapters of Tanya, we've been presented with a pretty comprehensive system of spiritual tools for managing the inner conflict. We have the first type of mayach shalat alev, which is control yourself, impulse control. We have the second type of mayach shalat alev, which is meditate and create new emotions to get yourself emotionally congruent with the behaviors you got to do. And we have the, in case of emergency, break glass, the backup system, which is how to suddenly push that button, that super Jew, uh, spiritual adrenaline rush, 
that we learned about, we just finished learning about in the past eight chapters. Okay? So there you have a comprehensive system for serving a chef. And it's pretty complete. So then what else do we need? Remember, Tanya, the Alta Rebbe says, is to simulate the experience of coming to him asking for guidance. So if you imagine yourself with each new chapter re-entering the Alta Rebbe's room and asking him again for more guidance, you have to ask yourself, well, what am I bothering him for again this time? Why did I... I just left, now I'm coming back in. Why am I coming back in? What's the tension that's driving this need for this next meeting? So the next issue is not that I need another tool in my spiritual toolkit. The next issue is really the, the human issue that being that we experience uh, emotions, we have moods. Even if the Alter Rebbe has given us a, a perfect system, if we lack the will or the desire to apply that system, because for whatever reason we're emotionally um, demotivated, then it's to no avail. So even if the system we've been presented with in the first 25 chapters is a wonderful system, if I'm feeling bad and therefore I'm lacking motivation, I'm not going to be able to execute and carry out that system that was presented to me. And that's basically where we're at now. In chapter 26, he deals with emotional well-being because if you're not feeling good, you're not going to do anything well. You cannot execute any task well when you're not feeling good. And that includes the system that was presented to us in the first 25 chapters of Tanya. You follow what I'm saying? Okay. To help you to really cement the idea, I'm going to start reading and I'm going to present you with the metaphor that the Alt Rebbe uses at the beginning of chapter 26. Perechavav. Brom kegein da tzarech leidai klal gadol. One must, however, know. However means, um, I'm going to switch things up on you a second here. Notwithstanding this wonderful system we were just presented with in the first 25 chapters, there's something you, need, you still need to know. And it's a big rule. He calls it a cloud gadol, a big rule. Just like in a material, in a physical battle or confrontation. Like two men who are wrestling with each other. One is trying to throw the other. So the metaphor is what? What? Wrestling. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't think they're fighting. I don't think it's it's athletic. It's competition. Yeah. It's not like a street fight. It's it's it's, it's athleticism. They're wrestling. Well, yeah. What? It's just a metaphor. No, 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 it's a different question. Oh, okay. Does the Tan Alter Rebbe presuppose, or is it a given that every individual is capable of having emotional well-being? Yeah. Yeah. So just like... You've got to throw well, in the word normal. Or no, whatever. I mean... So before we're even starting the chapter, everybody wants to put in a giant asterisk and say who this doesn't apply to until, <laughs> until it applies to nobody. Okay, you're right. We're just studying for academic purposes. All right, no problem. It's just anthropology, Hasidic anthropology. It doesn't apply to anyone, certainly nobody here. Okay, no problem. Take it however you want. He nay, now listen to me. He nay, im ho echad hu ba'atzlus If one of them is lazy or heavy, yinutzach bakal, he will easily be defeated, v'yipal gam im hu gibar yesu mechaveda, and he will be thrown even if he's stronger than his 
competitor. So you have two guys wrestling. One of them is stronger. One of them is weaker. But the weaker guy is feeling good, and the stronger guy is feeling blah. And what happens? The stronger guy gets thrown by the weaker guy because of the emotional advantage, the emotional edge. The guy who's feeling good ends up defeating a stronger opponent because the other guy is feeling bad. Kochamamish, this is just a metaphor. Kochamamish, so too literally, when we want to defeat our evil inclination. It is impossible to defeat him if we're feeling sluggish and heavy, emotionally heavy. Emotions that come from depression and a congested, plugged, plugged up heart that's plugged like a stone. What does it mean, a heart that's plugged up like a stone? He'll explain by in the next very, very next line. Ki'im, but rather, bezrizus, alacrity. Hanimshach is misimcha, psichas halev, that comes from joy and an open heart. So the opposite of timtum halev ka'evin, a heart that's plugged up like a stone, would be psichas halev, an open heart. That means where the emotions are flowing. There's a good energy flow in the heart. And it should be completely, his heart should be completely free of any trace, any trace of worry or sadness at all in the world. So here's the premise. Even if you have what it takes to beat your evil inclination, and you do, if you are not emotionally feeling good, if you're not walking in there with what he calls zrizos and simcha and psichas halev, then you're going to be defeated by an inferior opponent. Yeah. Isn't the feelings of um, worry and uh, the heavy feelings that drag you down, isn't that the Yitzhah power itself? Well, we'll talk about that, yeah. That sometimes the Yitzhah is best way to win is to uh, psychological warfare, to undermine your mood. Yeah, and we'll talk about the tricky ways that the Yitzhah actually does that, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so you understand the context <coughs> why Tanya is speaking about Simcha. I think it's very important. I think it's especially in our day and age where joy has become an idol. An idol is anything that is deemed important for its own sake. That's my definition of an idol. Because if you ask why is something important, the answer should be because it helps me serve Hashem. Or sometimes there are a series of because, 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 and it takes a few steps before you can trace it back ultimately to how that helps me serve Hashem. But if the answer is it's important just because it's important, well, only <laughs> Hashem is important just because he's important. Because only Hashem exists just because he exists. And anything else that you give that type of status to, and you say, it's important because it's important. In other words, if I say to you, you want, you want to be happy? Yeah, I want to be happy. Okay. Once you're happy, what are you going to do with your happiness? I don't know. I'm just going to be happy. That's idolatrous. It's like saying, I want a million dollars. Okay, what do you want to spend it on? No, I want to have it. So then the end-all, be-all is the million dollars, or the end-all, be-all is the happiness. It's not about happiness. It's about serving a Hashem. happens to be that the only way to do anything well, including serving a Hashem, is if you're in a good mood. So in order to serve a Hashem well, Yivdu as Hashem, Besimcha. You want to serve Hashem properly? How do you do it? Besimcha. Besimcha is an adverb. It's not the direct object. Es Hashem is the direct object. In other words, the goal is Avedas Hashem, serving Hashem. The means to properly doing it is joyfully. Yeah? It's a Pasuk and Tillam. Chapter 100. Right? Yeah. 
If there's Hashem B'Simcha, it's better. It's from Tanakh. Right. What? Where does the other one go? What? I'm not familiar with uh, other sources outside of Chabad, so I'm not sure. I actually am familiar, but that's my <laughs> passive-aggressive way of saying I'm not going to quote it in a Tanya shir. How you like that? Where does Simcha Parat's Geder come from? That's a Madush. It's actually, now since you, not since you got me started, this is very different than mitzvah de l'liyes b'simcha, because that's saying that the simcha itself <coughs> is the objective. Here we're saying the Avedis Hashem is the objective, and the simcha is what facilitates it and makes it possible. Yeah, well, eating is a mitzvah if that's how you, if that's the logic you're going to use. Which is fine. It's, it's true. I mean, we learned in chapter 7 of Tanya that even mundane stuff that you're using for the sake of serving Hashem becomes absorbed in the holy energy of the mitzvahs that you're doing. Okay. I think this is very important, the Al-Tareb's approach to Simcha. Simcha became very popular, but I don't think this nuance is well appreciated. There's a utility in Simcha. Let's not idealize it. There's a utility here, yeah? But that seems to be the paradox, because I think anyone, as you were were saying about the Yitzhahara being the one and the psychological warfare, because I don't think there's anyone in this room that doesn't want to be happy, right? (laughs) But so you're basically being told, this is what's going to happen. You're going to go through certain right. travails, and then you should be happy about it. So then really right. what ends up happening is then, then I'm sure everybody's trying, but then there's just not only that it, let's say it just doesn't work sometimes, then there's a guilt of like, well, I, I'm not right. serving God in the way I should be. Right, so then it becomes a, it right. compounds exactly. the, the negative feeling. Because not only am I not happy, which any normal person would be sad about, exactly. but now I found out that I should be religiously guilty about the fact that I'm not happy. So now it's like, yeah, okay. Exactly. All right. Yeah. If you thought you weren't happy before, <laughs> now you're going to be even more unhappy because you're sinning when you're not happy. Oh, no. Okay. Okay, but we're going to deal with it. That's what this chapter is about. It's about <clears throat> giving us tools for dealing with that. Okay. So everyone understands. First chapter, first 25 chapters of Tanya were presented with a system for becoming this Bainini, this person who, on the inside, has the inner conflict of the Russia, but on the outside is behaving like a tzaddik. And um, now, at, the, at this, really halfway through Tanya, Tanya is 53 chapters, so 26 is almost halfway through, um, we're saying, look, the system's a great system, but if you're not feeling good, you're not going to be able to implement it. So we got to take care of this issue. Okay. Why wasn't this much earlier then? Sometimes when I teach Tanya, I start with chapter 26. Modern day always start with People, you know why, another reason I often start classes with 26 is because uh, it's relatable. Like, uh, the first chapters of Tanya are difficult to get through if you don't already have some desire in learning about serving Hashem. A lot of people aren't into that, but you tell them this is going to help you be happy. Like you said, everyone wants to be happy, so then it's easier to sell. So you should feel complimented that I started with chapter one with you. Okay. <clears throat> now. The al Rebbe answers a question. <clears throat> and as for what's written, Shleim HaMelech says, the wisest of all men says, in every etziv, in every sadness, there will be an advantage. Well, that seems to provide scriptural proof that sadness is okay. Not only it's okay, but it's useful. So how do we deal with that? Because the Alter Rebbe just asserted a claim that sadness is going to undermine everything. 
But we have this verse here that says, Bechol Atzav Yemaiser, every sadness will have an advantage. Pirush, so here's what it means. Shegiya Eze Yisrin Amaylam is that there will come from it some advantage. Hine Adraba, to the contrary, Meloshin Zem Ashma, this wording itself implies, She Atzav Mitzad Atzme Ein Bay Mayla, the sadness itself has no value, rak, but rather she give a yavimimeno eze yisoin, that from it you will come to some advantage. In other words, read those words again. It doesn't say the sadness is advantageous. It says there will be an advantage which ensues from or following the sadness. Okay, great. What is that? Vahainu, and now he spells it out. The true joy in Hashem, his God, that will ensue after the true sadness at appointed times regarding his sins with a bitter, contrite soul and broken heart. Heart. There's a lot there to unpack. Hold on. Let's unpack it. It means a lot. First of all, the sadness itself is not advantageous, but it sets the scene for something that is valuable to follow. That's first of all. Second, another detail to pick up here is he calls it etzav ho'amiti, true sadness, or I might translate it as legitimate sadness. In other words, I'm sorry, the Alter Rebbe is implying there's such a thing called illegitimate sadness. Yeah, and he's, that? well, we're going to talk about it at length, about things that really you should not be sad about. There are things that you should be sad about. There are things that you should not be sad about. So etzav ho'amiti means sources of legitimate sadness. And he spells out what the sources of legitimate sadness are. He's, but first of all, let me read the next words. Le'itim is among him. At appointed times, that's key, that's crucial. It's at appointed times. It's not just in mitten out of the blue. It's at appointed times. It's on your schedule. And then he spells out what the source, legitimate source of sadness is. It's about being sad about your sins. In other words, let's unpack this all. <clears throat> Be sad about something that you can actually control. If you're sad about things that happen to you, you're going to drive yourself crazy because you can't control what's happening to you. But if you're sad about poor choices that you've made, <clears throat> okay, so then you can do something about that. No, nope, not talking about that. He's not talking about that. He's talking about where you were at fault. It's a legitimate sadness because you actually did something wrong. And you should be sad because you did something wrong. Trauma something happened to you. Where are you at fault? So, and that brings up anxiety and depression. And okay. It's not legitimate? Um... It's not legitimate, legitimate what? A legitimate physical reaction? It's a fact. It's a fact. So the word sadness here is not the same as pain. No, no, no. It's not the same as pain. What's the difference? What's the difference? Pain is not cerebral. You don't have to think about it. In fact, it happens on a level that thinking doesn't even, <coughs> doesn't even begin to touch. That's why you can't talk your way out of it. Sadness here is very cerebral. Isn't that what therapy is all about? What? Isn't that what talk therapy is? Talking isn't that what talk therapy is? Yeah, that's why talk therapy isn't effective on certain conditions. If you have a messed up perspective, then you can talk your way out of it. But if there's something that's not the way you're thinking, it's not your messed up thinking, it's 
on a deeper level, then you can't talk your way out of it. If you can control your sadness, can you control your pain? Control your pain? <laughs> but I mean, like, okay, so then, then you have When it hurts, you say, ow. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. But then you have to... I decide mean, how to feel about it. Yeah, that's a separate step. Okay, but that's a separate step. One is, I'm in pain. The other is, how do I feel about my pain? <laughs> those, are two, those are two separate. Okay, yeah, so that, that you could control. But isn't, isn't there a thought that if I made a choice at that point, there's the siyata d'shmaya that I was meant to make that choice, even if later I find out that it was the wrong choice. But at that point, that was the choice to make. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's a perspective. But that's not, he's not talking about, uh, you know, everything has its place, but this isn't it. <laughs> right here, what he's saying is this. You came to me and you were quoting King Solomon. The wisdom of Solomon said, King Solomon said that every sadness will have an advantage, and I have to address that. So he says, I'm, here's how I'll address it. It's talking about legitimate sources of sadness, which are not that something happened to you. A legitimate source of sadness is where you messed up. You deserve to feel sad. You made a bad choice. But even that, he frames it and says it has to be itim mizumonim, it has to be at appointed times. See, it's very, very important that if you want to deal with your dirty laundry, that it doesn't become something that overtakes your whole life. And it has to have its set times. It has to have its, its place, its time and its place. Let, let's... let's so Let's read a little bit more. Cause is the Alta Rebbe saying that it, everyone who has true joy has had legitimate sadness? That's an interesting question. Could, it, could you get true joy and avoid, could you just sidestep the whole sadness? Maybe. Not sure. Maybe. And are we going to get to pain? Yeah, yeah. In, in this chapter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is this a multi-week chapter? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Yeah, we could spend a year on this chapter, but we're not. We'll, we'll, we'll see how long it'll take us to get through it. Okay. Okay. Vaza yekoyim boyereshe dekra. And then after you deal with your contrition over what you chose wrong, then, see, there's this, this is a verse in Psalms. Ruch nishbara lev nishbara vegeimer. A broken spirit. Or maybe I didn't say... No. Hold on, i got to back up. I said, Okay, Okay, that's where I am. Right, so the Rebbe That through breaking down this spirit of impurity, or by th through breaking his heart, he breaks the spirit of impurity, which serves as a partition between him and Hashem. Like the Zayar says on the verse from Psalms, that a broken spirit and a broken heart Hashem will not reject. And then what ensues is the rest of the Pasuk, or actually the beginning of that same verse, Tashmini Sasin Vesimcha Vagaymer, let me hear <coughs> gladness and joy, Hashiva Lisa Sain Yeshecha, return to me the joy of your salvation, Vruch Nidiva Vagaymer, and place within me a generous spirit. In other words, this is not something that you get stuck in, it's something that is a very defined process. You set an appointment, you go deal with whatever it is that you legitimately feel bad about because you did it, didn't happen to you, you did it, and then you finish your session, you have to, if you don't finish your session this way, you didn't do it right, with relief that it's taken care of, it's done, I've been forgiven, we're moving on. So that's called productive sadness. Productive sadness is, I feel bad legitimately. I did a bad thing. Of course I feel bad. I have a conscience. So I go set an appointment. This is not something I'm doing all day long. I set an appointment. 
I review what I've done, I tell Hashem, I'm sorry, and I finish feeling great that it's all cleaned up. Obviously, if it's a Bein Adam L'chaved, I think, if it's interpersonal relationships, I also have to go to the person I wronged. That goes without saying. V'zehu tam ha-poshet le-tikun ha-rizal, le-mer mizmer zeh achat tikun chatzais kedem ha-limud, kedei lilmed b'simcha ha-mitas b'ashem ha-boachar o-etzav. That's why the Arizal set it up, that you say this verse that we just quoted, after Tikkun Chatzos, Tikkun Chatzos is a sad prayer we say about our sins that caused the Shekhinah to go into exile. But then we say this verse in order to prepare ourselves for the joy of learning Torah, which has to be done joyfully. And this joy that comes after the sadness has a special quality of superiority <coughs> Like light that comes from darkness. Light that comes from darkness. And there's different ways of understanding the advantage of light that comes from darkness. Some, on one level, it's subjectively, if you've been in the dark and then you enter the, the light, it seems much more brighter. Then there's an even deeper level where darkness itself becomes transformed into light. Isn't that the whole concept of the moon? I don't know. What, what we spoke about in chapter 7, Shuvah Ma'ava, which transforms sins into merits. Um, yeah, that's an even higher level. I, he, I don't think he's stipulating it has to be of that level of Shuvah, but that's a good reference. Kamesha Kosa Bezeir al Pasik, Varisi Sheshis, and Lachachma Mina Siklos, Girsana Oir Hulu, Ain Shom, Vadila Maven. Like it says <coughs> in the Zayar on the verse. King Solomon again says, I've seen there's an advantage of wisdom over folly, like the advantage of light over dark. But you could read it, not Yisrein Ha'or Mina Cheshech, advantage of light over dark, but light Mina Cheshech, the light that comes from dark, meaning light which is made out of repurposed darkness. In other words, because I confronted my guilt, and I finished it, and I went to the bottom of it, and I found forgiveness. Now I turned that spiritual yuckiness into a positive feeling of being loved and embraced by Hashem. Okay, so that's the type of legitimate sadness. By legitimate sadness, what we mean is productive sadness, maybe, let's say. Sadness that's actually going to get you somewhere. Because... It has a definite goal, it has a definite purpose. Um, if you wouldn't go into that sadness, you wouldn't be able to get the end result that happens by facing that sadness. So that's a productive sadness. You shouldn't be doing it all the time. It's only itim is umanim. It's at appointed times, but when you do set an appointment for it, it's productive. Again, why? Because it's something that you have control over. I don't feel good about what I did. I have to clean it up. I have to make a better resolution for the future. So that's a productive sadness. And now he goes back to the original premise of the chapter and he says, anyways, I'm talking about the importance of joy and as we know what the Arizal said on the verse, because you did not serve Hashem with joy, there's a, there's a, there's a verse. Tachas Hashem besimcha. Because you did not serve Hashem with joy. The simple translation is, because when life was good, you took it easy and you didn't serve Hashem, now Hashem is going to make life not so good for you. That's the regular translation of the verse. But the Arizal translates the verse and says like this. Because you didn't serve Hashem joyfully, you're making a lot of problems for yourself. In other words, it is a moral imperative to serve Hashem joyfully. So, let's just review what we've said. We started off and we said, you need to know the importance, the tactical importance of joy. We gave a metaphor. Two guys wrestling. One guy's weaker than the other, 
but he ends up winning because he's in a good mood. The other guy's stronger, he loses because he's in a bad mood. So too with the Yetzirah. You want to win? It's not enough that the Altar Rebbe gave you 25 chapters of training. It's not enough. You've got to enter your wrestling match feeling good. Then he says, well, what about <clears throat> when King Solomon says that there's an advantage to sadness? He says, exactly. He doesn't say that sadness itself is worthwhile. He says there can come from it an advantage, and that is in a very specific context. It depends what the sadness is about, and it depends when you're doing it. First of all, what is the sadness about? About legitimate, productive sources of sadness where you messed up so you should feel bad. And when should that happen? Itamizumanim, at appointed times. He doesn't say so clearly, but he mentioned, remember he mentioned Tikkun Chatzos, he mentioned the midnight prayer. In other places in Chassidus it talks about this as part of the bedtime Shema. The point is, it's not in the middle of your day, it's definitely not the beginning of your day. This is something you do, like a shopkeeper takes inventory when he closes the shop and there's no more customers there, then you take inventory, or like in a year. Elo, Elo right. is, right. So at the end of a year, you take inventory at the end of the year in the month of Elo. At the end of a week, by the way, Thursday night is a time for inventory, because your end of the week, the last weeknight of the week is Thursday night. At the end of a day, before you go to bed, bedtime Shema, you take inventory. But this is not something you should be doing <coughs> in the middle of the day. He'll talk about it a little bit more. He will talk about that a little bit more. More water? Yeah, yeah, sure. Thanks. Appreciate it. Okay. Now, <coughs> we're going to get into the difficult part. Yeah. Thanks. This is tough stuff. I feel funny starting it 45 minutes into, into class. It's like four or five lines, but really it could take, it could take hours to explain it just on the most basic level to explain it properly. <coughs> he talks about and I'm so scared to use this term, but I'm, I'm not going to shy away from it. Illegitimate sadness, or like I call it, unproductive sadness. I'm not against you. The al is not against you. Nobody's here judging you. We're working for you. We're trying to help you. And we're saying to you, there's some stuff you're sad about right now, and it's not working for you. It's not working for you. If you want to get sad about your sins from time to time, great. Set an appointment, do that, clean it up, and emerge feeling refreshed and reborn and clean. Beautiful. But there's some other stuff that you've been feeling sad about, and it's not serving you well. We're not here condemning you. We're not here to make you feel doubly bad about it. We're saying to you, this stuff is weighing you down. It's not helping you. We want to get rid of it. Don't be so attached to your suffering that you won't even entertain the notion of referring to it as not legitimate sadness. We're not saying that your feelings aren't real feelings. We're not saying that your experiences that led up to those feelings aren't real experiences. God forbid. We're not saying that. What we're saying is the fact that these things are troubling you is not working for you. It's not helping you. And we want to get rid of this so that you can get back to being the best you. Which ultimately is important because that's how you serve Hashem. Okay? Everyone's clear? No. You're not clear. No. Could the same sadness be helpful for one person and hurtful for another? This is categorically an unhelpful sadness. What we're talking about, it's not about who we're talking to. This is categorically not helpful. Okay. Now that we've established how important it is to get rid of this sadness, please, Rabbit, tell me how to do it. How do I get rid of the sadness? All right. 
והנה, עצה היועצה, the counsel that is given, לטהר ליבי מכל עצה ונדנו דייגה ממילי דעלמה, to get rid of any trace of sadness or worry about worldly matters. Mili da alma, worldly matters, as opposed to what? What's the other option? Spiritual. spiritual matters. There are worldly matters and spiritual matters. Spiritual matters we kind of actually spoke about. We said your guilt about your immoral choices. That's spiritual matters. But now we're talking about worldly matters. Worldly matters doesn't just mean real physicality. It could. It could mean that as well. But it means everything that happens in this world. Vafilo bane chayim ezayna, even the three biggies. These are the three big categories of blessing, and these are the three big categories of pain. Children, health, and wealth. Children, health, and wealth. These are the big areas. Family problems, health problems, money problems. Now, let me rephrase what I said. The fact that these things happened is real. We're not telling somebody, no, 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 it never happened to you. The fact that you respond with a certain pain to it. We're not saying that's illegitimate. Yes, this is painful. But the emotional reaction that you're having to it is not working for you. So we want to say, how can we take the way we're emotionally processing these real problems? They're real problems. That's why it says, afilo, even such big, big biggies like this. How can we do something with this so that we don't get emotionally weighed down by it. So yeah, these are the categories he's saying are sources of illegitimate or unproductive sadness. This is not helping you. These sources of sadness is not helping you. We want to get rid of it. Doesn't mean we're getting rid of the actual experience. The experience, either it happened, so there's nothing you can do, or maybe it's happening. We can dive in. Hashem can help to make it go away, but <clears throat> that's not what we're talking about right now. What we're talking about is my emotional response to the thing that happened or is happening. My emotional response. We have to be very clear what we're talking about here. So what am I supposed to do? I'm trying to serve Hashem. Think about it. Set the scene. I learned 25 chapters of Tanya, and I know about Mayach Shaltel Alev, and I know about meditation, and I know about the Ava Misuteris, and all this stuff I learned in, in 25 chapters, and I'm trying to be a good boy or a good girl and serve Hashem, but I have a life, and not all of my life is perfect, because that's the nature of this Gullus, and there are painful aspects of life, and I'm only human, and I'm responding to those painful aspects of life in a, in a way that is emotionally weighing me down. And I see, I see for myself, it doesn't allow me to serve Hashem or it doesn't allow me to fully, completely serve Hashem the way that I could be. So what am I supposed to do? Not only that, yeah. I'm angry at Hashem. Okay. And not only that, you say, but I'm angry at Hashem because ultimately these problems must come from Hashem. Well, let's find out. I mean, yeah, they do, but let's <laughs> allow a little suspense. <laughs> okay. Okay, what? Did you say that children, health, and wealth are worldly versus spiritual? Or yes, those are worldly <laughs> problems. <laughs> but they're not spiritual? No. Spiritual means you made a moral choice. That's, spiritual only means when your free will was at play. The fact that you are blessed in these three areas or you're experiencing struggles in these three areas is not your free choice. 
Whether you do a sin or you do a mitzvah, that's your free choice. So spiritual means whatever, does this make sense to you? Spiritual and worldly, basically, forget those terms. Free choice that you chose or stuff that's happening to you. That's it. Other people's free choice, by the way, could be their free choice, but for you, it's stuff that's happening to you. <laughs> I hope that's not overly complicated. Yeah, and vice versa. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. You have to separate it. You have to categorize it properly. If you're feeling guilty about an immoral choice, then we have one way of dealing with that. But if you're feeling sad because life is hard, then we have a completely different way of dealing with that. Okay? Okay. We have nothing to do with the pain. We have no way of dealing with it. These are just words, and the words don't take away the pain. Okay. The words are going to help you gain a perspective what to do with your pain. We can't take away your pain. We're not even going to pretend that that's possible. Well, it, it tell somebody not to feel a sensation. It's, it, it's not a productive order because you don't really have control over that. Whether it's from physical stimuli, like somebody, uh, they stub their toe and you tell them, well, if you were really spiritual, you wouldn't feel it. Come on. <laughs> or if it's emotional, like uh, somebody com comes over, they don't touch you, they say, they say a bad word to you, they call you a name. So there's just certain, just we're wired that we have certain responses to that. Um, and then, obviously, it goes without saying, some major trauma where there's just no way to avoid the way that it affects the body. We're not talking about that. We're not pretending to deal with that. We're talking about how you process your emotions about the situation. So you have to distinguish between sensations, which you have no, you have no power over, and ideas, attitudes, and emotions, which you do have power over. Okay. So here's, it's really, unwise to try to get into this. This is a very um, dangerous territory here because there are a lot of ways to teach this in a w uh, that, that, that hurt people. Um, and one way is if it appears in any way that we're being cavalier about people's suffering and we say, well, just get over it, just move on, it says in Tanya, here's the solution, so just go and do it. And I, and I want to be very clear. The Alter Rebbe is not minimizing these types of problems. To the contrary, the first thing he does is validate that these are a serious source of anguish. He says, When he says that word, the Alter Rebbe doesn't use words lightly. When he says, even family, health, and money problems, what he's saying is he's legitimizing the fact that those are big sources <laughs> of pain for people. And yet, he's saying, even those really serious sources of pain, we have a way of dealing with it so that we won't be emotionally undermined by our experiences. And in fact, 
we could even maintain a really positive attitude. So I just want to make sure everyone, everyone understands the al Tareb is not being cavalier, he's not being uh, insensitive. And again, like I said b- before, he's helping you. These emotions are not productive. These emotions have not been serving you well. These emotions are not allowing you to be your best you and to serve Hashem on your best level. So don't feel that you're not being validated. To the contrary, feel that you're, you are being validated. Somebody's saying to you, I get why this thing would be painful. I totally get it. But what do you want me to do? Because I, I'm, I'm so empathetic to the fact that these things would devastate you, I'm going to give you a certificate that says you have, that, that now you have a mitzvah to be devastated for the rest of your life. How about if I validate you in both directions? I'll say to you, I get why this would devastate you. And at the same time, I get why you would love to have a way to be able to move on and not be consumed by these problems. So that, that's the balance here. Okay? Actually, pretty freeing. It's supposed to be freeing. Yeah, it's supposed to be. Okay. Should we start the method? I mean, to, Paulo says it's. Do, do, we, what? It's 12. What should we do? You want to like a sneak preview of the method? I'll say the first line of it, but you have to promise me you're not going to be indignant or outraged if <clears throat> if uh, it doesn't come off the right way. Mudas zois la koil maimerazal. This saying of the sages must be known to all. Keshem shemavorech ala teva chulu, just like we bless Hashem and thank Him for good, and He says, etc., because if the Alt Rebbe can avoid spelling out something negative, he avoids it, and he just implies it, and we all know the rest of the sentence. So too, it's a Gubar in Brachas, so too, one is obligated to bless Hashem for the not good. And that is the source in Chazal of the Brocha Boruch Dayan Ho'emes, which nobody wants to make that Brocha. But there's a concept in Judaism that just like we acknowledge Hashem when He gives us good, we acknowledge Hashem when He gives us the opposite. Okay, so I guess there we spoiled. Yeah, it, it is all from Hashem. It is all from Hashem. Okay. Great. Fine. I still don't know how to do this. He's quoting a passage from the Talmud that says that you're supposed to look at everything, even the painful experiences, and say, thank you, Hashem. Okay? You told me what I'm supposed to do. You didn't tell me how to actually do that. I mean, I can say words, but he didn't teach me yet how to actually say those words with sincerity, how to actually feel that way. Hmm? Well, I don't... You want, you want to cry? I'll give you something to cry about. No, no, that's not what it is. No. No, he's going to actually help us contextualize these types of experiences. And again, I told you, it's not going to take away the pain. That's, that's an automatic response. You have no free choice over how your body processes stimuli. But 
on a cerebral level, the way you think about it, that we could reorganize. And we're going to reorganize the way that we view these types of experiences. It should be comforting for the youth. It should be comforting, should be comforting yes. Comforting. Yeah, and empowering, and yes. And relieving freeing. and freeing, yeah. Yes. And affect your body. Yes. Yes. The way we balance them is not balancing them. Balancing them is mishmashing them and confusing it more. Okay. Separate the two. Okay. I can be in pain and Bar Hashem, I'm not suffering. They're two separate things. The resistance to the pain brings suffering, yeah, compounds the suffering. So isn't there also different the levels, like the physical, the emotional, and the thought? The, the yeah, there's body. physical pain, emotional pain. The, the One might argue emotional pain is even worse. So we're going to the thought level to rationalize it so it affects the, the emotional and the physical. We're not talking about sensations, we're talking about emotions. You do not have any control over your sensations. But emotions, as we learned back in chapter 3, remember we learned where emotions come from? Hamid is hein toildeis chabad, that the emotions are the children of the intellect, of chokhmah bin adas. So the way you cognitively process, that determines the emotional response. So we can do something about the emotions. But emotions are entirely separate from sensations. Having a good perspective doesn't get rid of pain. It helps you to deal better with your pain. Okay, let's continue next week.